And my mom did not just wander off. That something has happened to my mom and it's time for us to figure out what it is. I need people to listen and help get her face out there. I need someone brave to be able to step forward. Because somebody knows what happened to my mom. I will never stop fighting for her. I will never stop being her voice. I will not stop until she is home. Kelsey Smith is wondering where is her mother, Echo Lloyd, and Kelsey's promises, she's hitting those 100%. She's been reaching out to numerous uh, true crimers in this space, talking to every publication that'll listen. This coverage is finally hitting national level exposure just over the past week, but we're now months behind on, in terms of trying to progress this case. We've got a lot of details. We've also got a little bit of a special collaboration that I've done with another YouTuber named Jason Hebert, a new up and comer in the missing person space. Uh, we interviewed Kelsey together. I'm gonna share some of that footage with you guys too, but I hope that you'll check out the full video. I'll have a link to that in the description box. We've got a lot to get to. It's time to turn on the searchlight for Echo Lloyd. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. And we're looking into the case of Echo Lloyd. Let's go ahead and start with our usual resource, NamUs. Uh, searching on the last name Lloyd, I see three cases that come up. None of them are for Echo. Now, uh, I did ask Kelsey about this on the interview that Jason Hebert and I did with her. Uh, she says that she's hearing from several people that they've been trying to enter Echo in Anamus, so it doesn't help for me to also give it a try. Uh, apparently, there's something in the verification of that information that isn't coming through. So typically, Namus will reach out to local law enforcement, confirm some of the details. Something about that isn't getting complete for some reason. Uh, thankfully, we have several other places that are trying to help by raising exposure, including Texas EquiSearch. And here they have a flyer that they've put together for missing person, Echo Michelle Lloyd, missing from Edwards, Missouri, since May 10th, 2020. And for anyone with a good memory, that is Mother's Day. Date of birth, May 23rd, 1972. She's 48 years old, uh, brown hair. Stands at five foot four, 110 pounds, brown eyes, white Caucasian female with fair skin. Um, the staff that's handling it is the Benton County Sheriff's Department. They've got contact information, case information. I'll have that in the description box below as well. If you can help with this case, please pick up that phone. Please get those tips in. Uh, for the description on what's going on with this, Echo Lloyd has been missing from her home in Edwards, Missouri since May 10th, 2020. It is not known what she was wearing at the time of her disappearance. Uh, her vehicle and purse were left at her home. Echo has tattoos. She has let it be with birds flying away on her left wrist, a band with Kelsey, Case, Caitlin, and Kylie on her right wrist, a blue survivor ribbon on her wrist, a rose on her ankle, and butterfly on her right chest. As a matter of fact, I did find an image of the Let It Be tattoo. Thank you to Missing Persons Planet for posting this. Um, so there's a really good shot of that tattoo. Unfortunately, I didn't find the others. If you've seen Echo since her reported disappearance, or if you know her whereabouts, please contact the Benton County Sheriff's Office. Once again, contact details in the description box down below. Now, the fact that this is posted at Texas EquiSearch, does that mean that they're coming in to help with this case? We've got some big challenges there because honestly, we don't know where to really start looking. And if we don't have anything that's driving them to a particular location, search efforts like this, um, they're very tough to get started. So they're aware of the case. They're kind of in a holding pattern. If Benton County Sheriff reaches out to them and says, hey, we've got a, a section of land, we're ready to go, we need help searching. From what I understand, Tim Miller and Texas EquiSearch, they're gonna be out there to do it. So um, it, it's kind of a good news, bad news situation. We've got a lot of people willing to help. We don't know how to help. That's really the big, um, tough spot in this whole case. And you're going to see as we get through the details, uh, it, it's just, it's a very 
it's very muddy. It's it's hard to to make a clear choice on on what to do next with a case like this. Uh, let's learn a little bit about Edwards. Edwards is an unincorporated community in southeastern Benton County, Missouri, United States. It's located on Route 7, approximately 16 miles southeast of Warsaw. Um, the Wikipedia doesn't even have a population count, just to give you some idea of how small the population is there, but another Google search will pull it up. Looks like just over 2,000 people live in this area. And just to give you a little bit of idea of what we're looking at, uh, we've got a lot of trees, thick woods, uh, multiple legs of water sources. Um, there's a lot that's going on in this particular area. So uh, you could imagine search efforts. Echo lived on a property that I think she owned 10 acres. Um, so her property alone, we're talking about a, a pretty decent search area. But then we've got all kinds of different possibilities out here. Um, so very, very tough case on the outset. Let's get to the basics of it, starting at ky3.com. And this is a family member. This was posted July 10th, 2020. It's been a hard two months for Mary Dubray and her family. Dubray's cousin, Echo Lloyd, has been missing since Mother's Day, May 10th. Lloyd hasn't used her cell phone, credit cards, or filled prescriptions since her disappearance. That's a big cause for concern, according to Kelsey, because uh, some of the prescriptions, I think some of them are related to some heart-related issues or some blood pressure-related issues, pretty serious prescriptions. And the fact that her mother doesn't have them or is separated just from her prescriptions, already a significant risk here. Despite that, I'm not finding any indicators that this case has been flagged uh, in as endangered missing by the local law enforcement. So I'm kind of wondering what's going on with that. It's just to be perfectly honest with you guys, it's one of the frustrations I have in doing work like this. You'll find certain departments that respond one way on a set of information. You take that same set of information into a different state or a different county and you get a completely different result. So uh, basically just on the medication load, from what I understand from her daughter, I think that should already kick this into endangered. Plus, we've got numerous signs that she doesn't have anything with her to help her take care of herself. I mean, obviously, she's not touching her accounts. Her car has been left behind. Her purse has been left behind. Cash is still in her purse. We've got all these things that are, they raise an immediate question. How is she able to continue taking care of herself? Um, and if you can't answer that question very strongly, I think that should kind of push that needle for the endangered missing status. The Benton County Sheriff's Office is investigating. Deputies are getting help from the Missouri State Highway Patrol and the FBI. Quote, we don't feel that she decided to leave her life or is gone of her own free will, Dubray said. We feel as the family there is definitely foul play involved. We want to get her face in front of as many people as we can so that someone can recognize her and say, oh, I know what happened. I'm going to help these people find their loved one, Dubray said. Uh, when you lose someone that you love and you don't know why and you don't know where they are and you don't know what happened, it's a wound that won't heal, Dubray said. It's really, really hard to move past that. So Echo is essentially going through a separation from her husband, but this is a situation that's been going on for a while and seems like it's actually, they're, they're in a pretty healthy spot with the fact that they're separating. Uh, Echo moves to this area in Missouri, um, buys this piece of property there. She really wants to be close to the water. Uh, the property is fairly close to, I mean, you saw there's, there's lakes and all kinds of different water channels kicking all over that area. Um, but, you know, you're talking a mother, several children, uh, new grandchildren coming into the family on top of that. And now we're hearing from the family. They're worried that this is a foul play situation. Uh, I'm going to run some clips later where you can hear from Kelsey exactly why some of them might be thinking that and maybe why we should all be very concerned that that's what's going on in this case. But let's go ahead and continue with True Crime Daily and try to put together some type of timeline. I'm going to kind of combine this with information that we heard from Kelsey as well. Uh, Lloyd was last seen on Mother's Day in Edwards, Missouri. Her daughter said she talked to her that day and brought her mother flowers and a card and left them on her porch. Now, when we spoke to Kelsey, which uh, as of when I'm recording this, it was last night, 
Uh, Kelsey actually said it was Saturday, May 9th in the evening that she last spoke to her mother on the phone. And then on May 10th, on Mother's Day, Kelsey does drive over to the home uh, and tries to leave her mom a gift. Her mother's not there. Kelsey leaves them on the back stoop. Uh, is is how she described it. Um, at some point that weekend, both Lloyd's cell phone and home phone started going straight to voicemail, her daughter, Kelsey Smith, said. Um, and that kind of raises, I, I see a lot of people talking about the home phone aspect. When we talked to Kelsey last night, the home phone thing didn't come up at all. So I don't know if there's just a little misunderstanding about that. She's done several other interviews and I've heard her try to make clarifications about this. Um, if I recall correctly, she didn't even realize there was a home phone till she got into the house and then she saw that there was a phone in there, but it looked like it might have been disconnected or, or something of that nature. Um, there's other things that we should focus on way more than the home phone, but I just want to try to put that out there because th there's a few different points when you're talking about this case that the social information is kind of wish washing or, or, or pushing around back and forth on those points. So I just want to be clear about when we hit one of those home phone, unfortunately is one of those cell phone, a little bit of one of those as well. Uh, because according to the articles, um, cell phone is not found in the home is missing, but according to some of the interviews that I've heard, it's possible that the sheriff actually found her cell phone in the home. And I'm putting, I'm phrasing it that way in particular, because I don't have solid confirmation. I'm really trying my best to present this to you guys, um, where I'm telling you the pieces that are relatively solid that we can kind of lean on and the other pieces where it might be a little wishy-washy. We also have an aspect where, uh, Echo was known to carry a pistol. Uh, she came to do this because she was assaulted previously about nine years before uh kelsey spoke about that on one interview in particular um so echo learned how to uh, arm herself she got a concealed carry permit um that pistol originally in some of the articles it's saying the pistol was not in the house uh some of the interviews that i'm hearing kelsey shared some information about the pistol, but then heard from law enforcement that she really shouldn't be talking about it. Um, so I don't know what's going on with the pistol at this point. The official articles are saying when Kelsey gets into the house that it's something that she notices is missing because Echo would essentially take the pistol with her everywhere. She literally wore it on her hip. Um, the social information, if you do go diving into all those interviews, you're going to hear that the pistol might have been found outside. And of course, that leads to a much more troubling situation. If that's actually true, that needle that I was talking about earlier for the endangered missing persons case, that thing should be pegged all the way. I really, I don't know what else it would take to flag this endangered unless in that particular county, they reserve that for, uh, you know, uh, elderly people or, or people that might need immediate attention of some sort, something along those lines. I, I'm not really certain. Um, so that's, what's going on with, with a few of the different points that you're going to hear about if you go looking into this case, but let's continue trying to put this timeline together here, uh, jumping over to NBCnews.com. want to give a quick shout out to Andrea. I think it's Cavalier. Um, she does some really good writing. Whenever I see her name pop up on an article, I know that we're in for some good information. So talking about Mother's Day, Kelsey goes over there. This is a quote from her. Her car wasn't in the driveway and the door was locked, Kelsey explained. So I left the card and flowers on the back porch and wrote her a note telling her to call me. Then the following days, we have Kelsey trying to call her and Kelsey described it to us as she would try in the morning, she would try in the evening. And that went on pretty much the whole week um, until Friday. Uh, at that point, the calls were all going straight to voicemail. On Friday, May 15th, Kelsey drove back over to her mother's house, but this time her mother's locked car was in the driveway. So now her car is back. It's locked up. Uh, Kelsey says, I started banging on the front door and the back. I was banging on the whole house, hoping she was inside and that she'd hear me, but no one was there. Uh, she said she also checked her mother's she shed where Echo could often be found working on various projects. Of course, she didn't see there. Um, some of the interviews I heard, Kelsey, like just, she looked everywhere. There was a board that you could move so you could see under the house. She checked under there. Um, there, I mean, she, she really did everything she could 
outside of the house. She contacted a neighbor, she told us. Uh, the neighbor didn't know anything about where Echo was at that time either. Uh, back to the article, Kelsey told Dateline her mother and stepfather had amicably separated a couple years ago and that Echo had moved into the house that was on 10, 10 acres of land near a lake. Uh, she loved the lake life, Kelsey said. It was a fresh start and I know she was happy there. After searching the property, Kelsey went to the neighbor's house for answers, but he told her that he hadn't seen Echo. Kelsey, now, according to this article, Kelsey broke one of the windows to the house with a rock and climbed inside. And I've seen that in several other articles, let me just point out. The story that we heard when we were talking to Kelsey last night was there was a window that was partially open or the window was kind of broken in a way where she could open it. Um, so a little bit different than this explanation of, you know, she took a rock, she smashed a window and then climbed inside, which, you know, if you listen to that, it sounds kind of dangerous. Like you shouldn't break a window with a rock and then go climbing through that. You could really hurt yourself. Uh, so I'm kind of tending to believe what Kelsey told us last night, that it was more about a, a situation where there was a window that wasn't secured properly or, or that was kind of broken in some way that she was able to open it. I could tell someone else had been there. Someone, but not my mother, Kelsey said. It wasn't ransacked, but there was a pile of trash with food and mold that's not like my mother at all. She's OCD. She, would, she wouldn't have left the house like this. In Echo's room, Kelsey found her mother's cigarettes and lighter on the nightstand. Below was her mother's purse, wallet, ID, and still some cash inside the purse. Uh, what I couldn't find was my mom's cell phone, her medications, her pistol, and her car keys, Kelsey told Dateline. I called the police right away, and then I went outside to wait and started calling out. Mom, Mommy, Echo. I was just willing her to appear in that moment. So very bizarre instance to enter that house and then to see it in that state, particularly for Kelsey. She's saying this is not normal for, for her mother. Um, so it makes you wonder, is, is someone else accessing the house? Big question for me is also, you've got the car in the driveway. Where are the keys? W what's that about? Uh, also, according to Kelsey, her mom wouldn't step outside without not just bringing her cigarettes and her lighter, but her whole purse. She said she literally just took her purse everywhere. Even if she was just going to step outside for a moment, it's like the purse would come with her. So... The purse, the cigarettes, and the lighter being on the nightstand right next to the bed. I also asked Kelsey about that. I was like, "Does are, are we talking about a situation where it looked like your mother was settling in for the night or something like that? Kelsey said there was a lot of construction projects going on in the house and that uh, it wouldn't be abnormal for her mother to put those items in that location because, um, you know, she was kind of... Uh, spending more time in the bedroom than usual because of some of the construction that was going on in the house. Uh, curious, I don't, I didn't think to ask if anyone was actually helping with that construction in any way, but you guys are going to see once we start getting into some information, the focus on this case just all of a sudden narrows very, very much. Um, my son was just one month old when she disappeared. She loves her grandbabies. She'd never leave us and she'd never leave her grandbabies. Searches were conducted, but without a specific area to pinpoint, the search has stalled over the months. Really, it's, it's the same factor I was talking about with the Texas EquiSearch thing at the start of this episode. Um, so going back to, I was trying to put a timeline together as we were talking to Kelsey last night. Um, so on Mother's Day, there is a sighting of Echo at a Dollar General, uh, and that is in Warsaw. That's another one of these points that kind of got pushed back and forth. It was uh, people were, were quoting the wrong area for where the Dollar General was. Um, there was also a trip to Walmart that apparently happened on that day. Kelsey found the receipt for that trip uh, in her mother's home, and it was signed by her mother. So, uh, that's something I asked her. I'm like, we're, we're sure, right? Like that's, that's, you know, the writing that you saw on there, that's definitely her writing. Kelsey was very, very certain it was her mother's writing. Uh, cause I was just theorizing what if someone took her credit card and, you know, went shopping and then came back to the house and, and dropped it off. And she was convinced that her mother wrote that. So 
we didn't we don't have solid time frames but at some point during the day trip to dollar general trip to walmart and apparently the dollar general in warsaw pretty close to walmart so it's feasible this is all part of one trip that they were two stops on one trip um somewhere in that afternoon is when kelsey drives to the home and leaves the gift on the back stoop i have a time range there she was kind of estimating but she thinks somewhere between 3 30 to 4 30 is when that happened um then we get to the phone calls all week and then we get to friday when kelsey drives over again sees the locked car on the driveway opens the window and makes this discovery that's really all we have for the timeline on this there's just not a lot of other information to lean on but we did learn a little bit of an interesting fact about that gift that she left on the back stoop and what happened to that over the course of that week uh, laughing hawk is asking were the flowers in the house did you notice where the items that you left on the stoop did they wind up in the house the card um was open um and all i remember seeing and i don't remember if i got the card or not um was the envelope was on her dresser um you know standing up um the plant was still outside though um i would have figured mom to take the plant in but um it was it was sitting on a different and sitting in a different place. It wasn't still just sitting in the stoop either. It was sitting somewhere different. The card was on her dresser. Um so I figured she had she had gotten it. But I, you know, I could be I could be wrong, I guess. You know, it could have been somebody else who got that if they had access to her home. So very strange to me that uh, the gift would be left on the back stoop like that. Card brought inside, but a gift left outside, moved, and left out there for five days by the time Kelsey gets back there. It's making me wonder if Echo's disappearance or whatever happened to her uh, happened. It could have happened on Mother's Day earlier than Kelsey's arrival. Uh, quite honestly, even confirming that Echo made the purchase at Walmart, that's not to say that Echo's the one that brought that receipt back to the home. Um, so there's there's a lot of strange considerations with this. And now when you're talking about someone else being involved around this, who's the most reasonable person um, to believe could be around her or interacting with her uh, or even possibly do something to her? And that's where Kelsey starts telling us a lot of somewhat strange and bizarre information about a neighbor. You had um, talked several times, and I know we can't go into details in terms of naming the neighbor, but can you give us some more insight into their relationship? I find it interesting that the first thing you did was essentially start reaching out to the to the neighbor to find out where she was when she was missing. Right. So um, about a month after mom had bought this house, um, I was staying with her at the time. Um, we hadn't bought our house yet, um, close you know, to hers. Um, we were probably there, I want to say it was about a month or so. Um, and he met her by walking up through the back woods um, behind her house. Um, so she kind of brought him up you know, the front porch to meet me and my son. And... Um, it was just, it was really odd. It was odd how he showed up. And then he kind of never left um, after that. Um, you know, he didn't leave even whenever he was asked. He didn't leave when he was told. Um, so, I mean, he preyed on her good nature, I think. You know, he just found somebody who was vulnerable and somebody who wanted a companion and a friend uh, to confide in. Um, you know, someone down here, someone local, um, a buddy. Um, you know, and I think that's what she thought she had found in the beginning. I think by the time maybe that she figured out what was going on in the end, it was too late. I had to, I had to sit this person down, um, and discuss boundaries, um, and how there weren't any for them. Um, you know, needing to lock our doors, um, her wanting to have the curtains down, um, you know, just in case she wasn't sure if he was ever just going to show up, he would come in without knocking, not announce. I kind of heard in the web sleuths interview where it almost sounded like, um, like he was squatting. Like, did he take over her house? So she, yeah, she, she came to me two weeks before she disappeared. Um, and it really messed with me. 
um, it really messed with me because she came over um, and it told me, you know, he had taken over the house, the car, the keys, the money. Um, you know, I'll remember those exact, I'll, I'll always remember those exact things. Um, and she told me a, a lot of different things over a couple hours. Um, and she decided to go home. You know, it was her home. Um, she was, she was calm then. She was going to take her home back. Um, you know, um, and she's, she's stubborn and strong willed. I, you know, I really tried to get her to stay here, but, uh, it kind of threw me off. And then she, you know, she was calling me every day. Um, you see everything 2020 in hindsight. So, um, yeah. I wish I would have seen then how I see it now. Um, but you know, I just remember even letting her leave my house that day as she drove away. I thought I should have hugged her again. Um, you know, I asked her right before she left, do you have your pistol? And she said, you know, it was in her purse. Her and I had discussed because the, this boyfriend aspect has been thrown out. It's it's something her and I had really discussed. And I believe my mother 100% over, you know, anything else. And that they were just friends. It was strictly platonic. There, there wasn't anything, you know, like that between them. And I truly believe it was probably a want what I can't have situation. Um, I think that she was, you know, telling him it was time for him to finally go. Uh, and he couldn't yeah. handle that. Well, and it's something important to remember is that even from her perspective, if it was a platonic relationship, from his perspective, things could have been a lot different. And right. especially if he feels like he's making these inroads of like, oh, look, I'm able to stay at her house longer and longer. And now I'm sleeping on the couch and now I'm using yeah. her car. Um Right. And that's where it gets scary because it's it's really about his perspective at that point, not about hers. Right. So we have this very tough relationship, kind of hard to understand, especially being an outsider. Um, but Kelsey, very clear. She doesn't think that it was a romantic relationship, at least from her mother's perspective. But we've got this male neighbor essentially moving himself into Echo's life to the point that Echo feels like she has to go back and kind of restake her claim to her own home um so if nothing else even if we're just talking about the emotional landscape there something very strong and deep is going on in that relationship of of some kind and is that possibly some motivating factor in her disappearance we also asked kelsey about the possibility of other people i know we're very focused on the neighbor especially with this information and the information seems strong enough that we should be but what about is there anyone else in the scope of what's going on around this and we heard about the trip to dollar general and an interesting observation that the employees there made and did when you spoke to the people at dollar general did they mention that she was there with somebody uh, yeah, they did mention, yeah, that there was um, supposedly a group of people, I think, waiting for her outside. Um, from what they've, they've said, yeah, um, I've just kind of taken that information and passed it on to law enforcement. Um, again, I'm going to have Missouri State Highway Patrol really kind of dig into that. There is much more to see if you check out the full interview. Once again, there's a link to it in the description box below. And please do me a favor. If you like respectful true crime coverage, uh, when you visit Jason's channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Show some support for a very good up and coming true crimer. Uh, you know, I'm always saying there are too many of these cases. I can't do them all myself. I've got literally hundreds and hundreds on a list waiting for coverage. Uh, so I, I welcome people that are handling it in such a good way like Jason. So please check him out. So there is a reward that has been posted $7,000 for information on the disappearance of Echo Lloyd. And there is a GoFundMe where they are raising funds, I believe to further increase the reward, but also to help with the expenses that they're already incurring, uh, just in terms of posters and all the different work that goes into dealing with having a missing loved one. So of course, on behalf of myself and my amazing supporters on PayPal and Patreon and people that buy merchandise, thank you guys all so much. We're making a donation to this GoFundMe just as soon as I'm done filming today's episode. If you'd like to follow official developments on this case, please go to facebook.com forward slash bring Echo Lloyd home. Of course, I'll have that link down below as well. And this is the official 
family page for the case. There's several other um, different private groups that are going on out there. Um, for some reason, I, I don't want to go into it too much, but one of these private groups even ejected Kelsey from being a member there. So be very cautious about what groups you're you're joining when looking into this case. Uh, I can't imagine what the justification for that was, but there is also a website that is being pulled together. It's still under construction, but that is bringechohome.com and a healthy web sleuths discussion and a quick shout out to Trisha. She did a very good interview on this case as well. If you go through the threads here, you'll be sure to bump into it. I uh, also want to say thank you to Gray Hughes for taking an interest in this case so early on. He's got an interview with Kelsey and it's interesting listening to all these different interviews and hearing how the information um, is not changing, but how what she's learning is changing from one to the next. So if you do do a deep dive into this case for yourself, just know you're going to hear some variations from one thing to the next. And then, of course, you know, also with information that law enforcement doesn't want to necessarily put out there. But we are left with this poster where is Echo Michelle Lloyd? And this is where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Um, it's very hard to have gone through all this material, listened to several interviews with Kelsey, spoken to her directly myself, and to not be very focused on the neighbor. My focus certainly strong in that direction, but there's still a lot of unknown factors with this case. Um, and there's a lot of possible outcomes. So let's talk about it in the comments down below. As always, I ask that we remain respectful and, uh, especially cause Kelsey has been on so many different platforms, sharing this story in so many different groups and having strange reactions. Like the thing I mentioned with the, with the private Facebook group, uh, let's show Kelsey what the brain scratch community is all about when it comes to sharing theories, doing it in a respectful way, and maybe kicking up some ideas that can help her get this case going in the right direction. Um, she's, it's obvious her heart's in it. She's working extremely hard on all fronts and trying to balance the rest of her life around this. So uh, maybe it's that simple. Maybe you have some ideas for how she could do that or people that can help her and kind of take some of the weight off of her back of feeling like she has to, to carry this and other family members. I, I spoke to her about that too. It's so important. Um, you're putting a team together. You really, you can't do this all yourself. So if you guys have different suggestions or way to be part of that team, Talk about it in the comments down below. And um, to all of Echo's family, we're really sorry that you guys are facing this. I'm hoping that answers are coming sooner rather than later. Um, you've got a lot of great resources waiting to jump. It's just a question of where, if nothing, the online community has already showed it is supporting this case every which way that it can. And uh, I know that there's a bunch of people with boots on ground actually looking to do the same thing. We kind of just need the direction of uh, where to start the searches. So big thank you to everyone that's being so caring and helpful with this case. And I thank you, you guys for being a part of that. As a matter of fact, help us keep the exposure raised to this case. Please share it with your friends, family, anyone that you know in Missouri. And let's see if we can get Echo's face out there seen by more people. And maybe the person with the right information picks up that phone and, and makes the phone call. Big thank you once again to Jason Hebert. Big, big thank you to Kelsey and all the other true crimers that have been helping on this case. Before I end today's video, I want to thank several people that are now supporting the channel through Patreon. Big thank you to Chris Burridge Barney, uh, Tanya Gottich and Becky. And also a very big thank you to Jillian Kuzma who increased her pledge. If you'd like to do the same, visit lordnarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal or buy merchandise. All of it keeps me here always with limited commercials, helping people, helping these families in these tough situations, making donations in some cases like we are today. I can't do that without your guys' support. So thank you so much for doing that. Take care, everyone. I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch right here on the Lord and Arts channel.